right there. She drops the bombs, keeps moving. So I'm going to stop the bomb and let her drop that bomb again. Say it again, Dr. Marlene. We can only do what we have in our belief system. And a belief system is simply a thought we keep repeating until you create a new belief system. That's yeah. huge. Hello, Vibrant Beans, and welcome back to The Beats. I am Kelly Kennedy, and I have the unique pleasure to talk about fur babies today with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Marlene Siegel, who's a bioregulatory and standard doctor of veterinary medicine, who is extraordinary in so many ways. She not only cares for fur babies like you could not believe um, unless you see it with your own eyes, honestly. So this is an audio podcast. I know we do record this video wise. I don't know if Marlene, Dr. Marlene's planning on putting any videos up, but I have been to lectures with Dr. Marlene and I, as you know, I like to express and, but in her lectures and dental street lectures is where you hear me gasp the most and where I literally, she is such a good, not only doctor, but she also is a good documentation and she really has so much documentation to show when there's nowhere to turn when you can't turn it around bring them to dr marlene and she will turn them around using all the same techniques and tools that we use by regulatory but i wanted to dive in a little bit today into her program into her process into who she is and really share this wonderful heart-filled soulful woman that shows up in ways that not many people show up. And I so appreciate that about you, Dr. Marlene, and really cares at a level for the fur babies. I'm sure it hasn't been an easy road, but welcome to the Beats. And thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward to sharing with the community a little bit about what you have to offer from an educational perspective and support for the side of the family that so many people don't think about sometimes with bioregulatory medicine. So I'll shut up now and let you talk. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Kelly. I love you, my soul sister. And thank you for having me on and sharing the the Hope for Baby story. It's my passion for sure. Yeah. So you started as a standard vet. Yeah. We all go through veterinary school with the same allopathic training. And it was about 15 years into my allopathic world. And I practice good medicine, even on the allopathic side, you know, I thought I was doing a good job, but certainly saw a lot of relapses. And then there was an incident where my youngest daughter was in a horseback riding accident in a show and it, and the horse saved my daughter's life. So it was my quest to fix the horse. And it was in that quest that I had equine veterinarians come look at her and they said, we don't know exactly what's wrong with her, but here are your two options. You can put her out to pasture She'll never be safe to ride again, or you can put her down. And it was that comment of there's nothing more that can be done that woke something up inside of me that said that is not an acceptable answer. And I really understood what people feel like when they're told that or they're told that in regards to their two-legged loved ones, let alone their four-legged ones. Then that became my journey to not only find answers, but to create an entirely new way of practicing medicine. And it wasn't like, it, you know, you don't think about it at first, like, oh, I'm going to change veterinary medicine. But, you know, the name of my course is Transforming Vet Medicine. And that was named literally 10 years before I created the course. So how profound <laughs> and, and divinely driven the whole process was. So I'm very grateful. And I'm still learning. Every year I'm coming out with something new and something innovative and something applicable take a lot of my inspiration from the bioregulatory world and from a lot of the human things that are being done that are so innovative in today's society. And it's all natural medicine, though. That's the irony is we're doing what nature intended and we're just figuring out how to do it more effectively in our environment. You know, and and I mean, you know, disrespect. If I end up calling you Marlene instead of Dr. Marlene, it's purely because you're a friend. Um, and Dr. Marlene, what I find so fascinating and what we've talked about before is, you know, I started pre-med at Cornell and I switched to pre-vet and I grew up and I, where I grew up, I worked in a pet store since I was like nine or something like I, like before you could have a job, I basically hung out this pet store and it was a small animal pet store. And then I, when I went to Cornell, I did nutritional research um, on sled dog animals be or sled dogs because I wanted to be more 
preventative after what had happened with my dad and my health and all that my first year at Cornell. And so my analogy that I always use is fish tanks, cleaning fish tanks and terrain medicine. And I always talk about the animals. And when I met you, I found it so fascinating because I my analogy is always like, well, deer don't have to do it and the rabbits don't have to do it. So why do you have to do it? Like, you know, why do you have to eat packaged food? They're not eating. Why do you have a question about what to eat? <laughs> they don't have a question about what to eat, you know, but also like how to take care of ourselves and and replicating nature. And I've always said to come back as a dog or a cat and watching dogs and cats and how they live their lives. We have so much to learn from them. And as we westernized animals, how sick they've gotten. So can you just speak to that for a moment about what you've seen in your practice and how you've shifted it to bioregulatory, how to me, it seems nonsensical the way they were doing it before versus how we do it, how we look at it. You know, the first 15 years of my practice, I truly knew nothing about nutrition. And we were wined and dined by the large big box companies. And so that's what we carried in our practices. And it really wasn't until the incident with Lily and my daughter that I started looking deeper into what is causing dis-ease and what is bioregulatory medicine. At the time, I didn't call it that. I Who knew? But now I understand it's all about the root cause and understanding how the body actually works. And it makes sense. So my analogy for my clients is typically, if you look at nature, what is nature doing? And then you got to model that because nature doesn't waste energy and it doesn't make mistakes. We, as man, we try to do things better than nature, but we've never been able to master that. So the more we can replicate what their natural lifestyle would be like, given the constraints of living within a household that they were never designed to live in. But if we can try as best as possible to mimic the kind of lifestyle that they would have had, a species appropriate diet, the type of exercise, the reduction in toxins, the ability to detoxify, how to support the mitochondria. When we look at those elements and we can replicate that in our modern world, we see absolute transformation in health. So I don't believe there's disease. I think that's something that we've been conditioned to accept as normal, when in reality, it's dis-ease and it's just your body or your pet's body telling us there's something that's not right. So now my perspective is I look at a symptom and instead of naming it and blaming it, I look at that symptom and I ask the question, why is that showing up? What is wrong below that chain that we need to fix? And we all know now that a majority of it starts in the gut and then it works its way from there. So I try to keep it very simple for pet owners. And this is the best advice ever. We can break down any dis-ease into three things. A deficiency of essential nutrients. That's an essential nutrient that the body cannot manufacture insufficient quantities on its own. So you have to get it from your food supply and it can't be synthetic. Number two is toxins. And that's an overwhelming amount of toxins that the body can no longer detoxify through its normal regulatory pathways. There's almost always a combination of deficiency and toxicity going on at the same time. The third component is mitochondrial dysfunction. So when we have these deficiencies and toxicities, it leads to the mitochondria not being able to perform their normal metabolic function, which everybody knows that it produces energy in the mitochondria, but it's also the major communicator communicating with the microbiome and through the fascia, telling the body what needs to be turned on and turned off. And when all of that is disrupted, there's nothing left but these rogue cells who have nobody communicating with them. It's like the little lone army that's been cutting off. They, they're cut off from the major blood dude. And they go, I don't know what to do. No one's giving me instructions. So I'm going to be in self-preservation mode and I'm just going to keep growing. And that's my definition of cancer cells. And then there is always a, an emotional component to it as well. But I think if we just even keep it simple to deficiency, toxicity, and mitochondrial dysfunction, that'll take us almost to the finish line. So are you saying that my dog doesn't need a dewormer pill every single month? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, you know, thank you for saying it that way because, um, you know, we're, we're trained in our world to demonize the viruses and the parasites and the bacteria, and yet they are more important in our body than our own cells. So we have more 
information that is regulated through their DNA and their information than we have on our own. So it's not that they are the problem. We literally cannot live without them. It's the fact that we've created a terrain, a home that they live in that is so out of balance that the pathogens are now having to take over because it's not even a hospitable place to live if you're a normal bacteria or virus or parasite. So we, we've really got it dialed in wrong. It's not about decimating all the bugs. It's about creating that terrain where everybody can still live in harmony and do their job. And I really appreciate you saying it because I live in Pennsylvania and we've had dogs my whole, like, since I've lived here. And um, much like when I take my son to a standard pediatrician, which I don't, but I can imagine what that would feel like, you know, the pressure to get the vaccines and all the things. I have not found of that in this area that knows how to tolerate me or deal with me or want to deal with me, nor have I found a groomer that understands or wants to deal with me either. Because essentially I walk in and I'm like, what are you talking about? No, my dog doesn't need that. No, my dog doesn't need that. No, my dog doesn't need that. I want you to do your check once a, a year that I'm not doing. Look in their mouth, hear their heart, do the thing. But like, why all of a sudden, I think about this all the time, like, how do cats get diabetes? How do dogs end up obese? How do dogs end up with joint problems and and heartworm. How does heartworm work? Like, I've never concerned myself over heartworm. And I live in an area where I pull ticks off of my dog a couple times a month. Yeah. Especially right now. And I'm not concerned about my dog getting Lyme. And I don't treat her with flea and tick. And she doesn't have the dumb cholera that's so toxic. But this is, you know, people walk in the standard vet's office, they don't know. What are some of the things that are challenging or different when they walk into your office or a, an office that's been trained by you? So let's, for your audience, let's give them a roadmap on what to do, what not to do. I think that's the easiest way because it's not that allopathic medicine is horrible and it's not that the, every veterinarian is intentionally bad or evil that they know what they know and they don't know what they don't know. And that's the same for everybody in this planet, right? We, we can only do what we have in our belief system. And a belief system is simply a thought we keep repeating until you create a new belief system. So this is the roadmap that I'm going to share. And that's why I love Marlene. Right there, she drops the bombs, <laughs> keeps moving. So I'm going to stop the bomb and let her drop that bomb again. Say it again, Dr. Marlene. Oh, which part? It was... Um, our belief systems. Our belief systems are our belief systems, which is the thoughts we keep having that create the belief system until right. we change our thoughts and we get a new belief system. That's yeah. huge. It, it is huge. And and interestingly enough, most of our belief systems are not ours. Are They're ones that were imprinted upon us from birth to seven and then from our caregivers and our teachers and our doctors who taught us, you know, all of these layers come in and, you know, we're a society where we, we are supposed to respect our elders and are more learned and believe that what they're teaching us is right. And they really do believe that it's right. But then there comes that come to Jesus moment, you know, that moment where you have your aha awakening and you go, wait a minute, maybe that isn't the way it's supposed to be. So when we look at the food industry for animals, of course, the whole kibble and processed food all came about as a way to get rid of the waste product from human processing. We shouldn't be eating processed foods. And then we take all the crap that we can't eat and we put it into a pet food and we heat it at high temperatures, enzymatically killing everything in there. It's nutritionally depleted. And then we expect to feed that. And you know who thought any different because we weren't taught anything different. But I digress. Let's go back to a six-step process that every pet owner can start employing. And this is actually in a free PDF. If you go to holistichealingvet.com, and Kelly, I'm sure you can put that in your show notes, uh, holistichealingvet.com, and they can get the PDF for free. But step number one, we got to stop doing the things that are causing the problem, right? We can't just keep living the same lifestyle that is creating all of this dis-ease and expect it to change with a pill or a potion. So 
number one, we got to feed a species appropriate diet. And I could spend an entire three hours just talking about that. But suffice it to say, we need to feed a species appropriate diet. What would that animal eat in the wild if we weren't around? And we can mimic that. Number two, they have to- just for clarity, my dog doesn't need broccoli and rice because they would not get broccoli and rice in nature. Especially not the rice. Um, yeah. So we, we definitely promote a raw diet with organ meat and the right balance of beet, fat, bone, and organ meat. So this is not about throwing down a piece of chicken breast, you know, in, in raw from Publix or your grocery store. There, There is a whole process to understanding what a balanced raw diet would look like. But for today... Um, it's a raw diet. We Number two would be water. And I promote structured, filtered water. And oh. I've had a lot of talks on structured water. It's so, so important. That is not coming out of your tap, girls and boys. And yeah, so- please stop feeding your dogs chemical-laden water that's known as yeah. tap water. That's why they often go to your toilets and drink it because at least it's outgassed the chlorine. And <laughs> they're willing to drink that because it's sat for hours. Yeah, so we have to process on water. And then uh, number three is anything that is touching their skin. So, of course, getting rid of all those xenoestrogen-laden products like shampoos and conditioners and laundry soap and all of that. And then your air quality, making sure you don't have mold and that you aren't using those chemical deodorizers. And then we get into... Um, everything that's outside, you know, are you making sure that they're not walking through toxins that you're spraying on your lawn? Electromagnetic frequency is huge, right? Most people are, they've never measured the EMF in their houses. And especially if you have a smart meter, oh my gosh, it could be decimating to your health. I just recently had a big fight with my electric company and they made me put a smart meter on. I have solar and I get solar credits. It's like $700 a month. And they were going to take me off the solar system if I didn't change to a smart meter. So I agreed to do it, but at a particular date. And then I had my little Faraday cage ready to go. Well, they came two weeks early, jumped my fence and put a smart meter on my house without my knowing it and without my agreement. And I found out because I started having heart arrhythmias. I started having tremendous fatigue. I was wearing a meter. So I knew what my deep sleep was non-existent anymore. My heart rate variability went to crud. And so two weeks goes by and the guy comes to put the smart meter in and he goes, I don't understand. You already have one. I put the Faraday cage on immediately. My arrhythmias were gone in 12 hours. It took me three solid months to recover my adrenals. So I'm telling you, you people, you have to test and see what kind of EMF pollution that you have going on in the household. And a lot of people have the animal pet beds right by the router. And they're in the house all the time if they're indoor pets. So, you know, you leave your house and you're outside, but they're still getting 24-7 all that EMF that's being produced in the house from all your smart appliances. So, you know, that's another whole issue, but that you have to test. And then last but not least are the ants that live in our brain. (laughs) And those are the automatic negative thoughts. And we all oh, have I was like, animal. what the hell are you talking about? The ants <laughs> and the automatic <laughs> negative thoughts. Oh, I yeah. love that. I love yeah, that. So um, we all have them. It's that moment where you start having your negative thoughts and your negative belief systems come through. Well, the reason why that's so important is because when you are having negative thoughts and you're creating these negative emotions, you're creating these neurotransmitters because your thoughts are signaling your body to do something. So now you create these neurotransmitters that are going down to the cell and saying, danger, danger, awful things happening out here. You need to go into cell danger response mode, or you need to uh, to uncover different genetic information to survive in this horrible environment that's killing us out here. And who entrains to that? Your pets. So it's bad enough that you do it to yourself, but now we have that whole principle of entrainment, which means that when your animal is near you, actually even not near you, energetically you're connected to them, that you're transmitting all of this negative emotion and fear and anger and frustration. You're admitting that and entraining to your pet who then picks that up and then they start to produce these neurotransmitters that also compromise their health. I mean, it actually affects affects your immune system. 
your lymphatics don't work as well, your lymphocytes don't work as well. It's just, it's a crash mode all the way around. So that was just step number one. <laughs> Those were just the things that you have to stop doing. And in my, we do have an online course for pet parents and it goes way, way deeper than that. But that's step number one. Step number two is we need to make sure that we have supplied all the essential nutrients the body needs to do its job. Now, an essential nutrient is the nutrient that the body cannot make in sufficient quantity on its own. It has to come from our diet. Well, you'd have to live under a rock today to know or not know that our food is nutrient depleted, right? It's grown on nutrient depleted soils. The farming practices are, if they're not biosustainable, they're, you know, they're not going to be having all the nutrients that they need. Glyphosate blocks the shikimate pathway and bacteria. We're not making aromatic amines, which are needed to make our neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. So that it's a cascade of problems. So it's really important that we make sure that we are supplementing ourselves and our pets with the essential vitamins, minerals, and fatty acids. And then number three is we work on gut health. We know how important gut health is. So how do we repair the tight junctions? Of course, you can't repair them till you stop damaging them. So that's why step one, two, and three. And then as we're repairing the gut lining, then and only then can we start supporting the organs of elimination and allowing the body to detoxify. So kidney, colon, lungs, liver, skin, and Kelly and my favorite, the lymphatics. Um, you know, and fascia lives in, in that little category that we just talked about. So the fascia is that glue between the cells that we need to be paying a lot more attention to. So everything else works as well. And then number five is the, the mitochondria. It's all about how we can have healthier and more um, functioning mitochondria. So we make more energy. We have better communication. The body works better. Anti-aging, all of that works towards anti-aging. And then number six, and where with my clientele is we work on the emotional component. You know, what, what is the emotion that is linked to that dis-ease, whether it's in the pet or with the person? And there is a tremendous relationship between the two. So we can almost look at a person and know what that animal is going to reflect or mirror in its health consequences as well. So it's all connected. It's the metaphysical world and the physical world, the mental, emotional, spiritual, all plays together. We're not here in a, in a solitary form. We're in this amazing hologram and uh, we need to use all the players in that hologram to have the best outcome. And I love that you brought up the emotional component amongst all the other things. And that PDF is amazing. So make sure you go to her website and and download that because what she just gave you is a great checklist as a good starting point to figure out, okay, where do I need to start? What can I start to eliminate? What can I start to add in? But the emotional component, as we both know, is 90% of all illness. And you know, I ran a dog yard at Cornell and it was fascinating that there was this one particular dog, his name was Sticker, and he was a rescue and he bit every single person that has ever worked in the dog yard with the exception of me. Sticker never bit me. And why? Well, because I had instant respect for the dog, right? Because everybody told me how he bit. So I was like, okay, I just went up and I I've been raised around animals my whole life. So I just knew to have a conversation with the dog. And I just always came in and was like, Sticker, are you ready for me to come in and like, you know, put the the stuff on your ear so the flies don't get you now? No, now is not a good time. Okay, I'll be back. I'm going to go do these five hundred other dogs and I'll be back. And I just always waited till I was in the flow. Like I've always been this crazy person. Yes, that talked to animals and plants and everything. But I find it so fascinating as I've run a practice now for 19 years with humans and looking at all of life is a reflection, right? Water is a reflection. Our life is a reflection of our thought life of our ants and our pants, our positive associated thoughts as well, our ants and our pants, ants and pants. <laughs> uh -huh. um, here all week, folks, here all week. Uh, but it is, uh, do you find the same thing that the the animals are reflecting what the humans are going through and vice versa. I had a client a couple of weeks ago um, that was here and she's dealt with some chronic UTIs. And as that's cleared up, all of a sudden her dog ends up with UTI. She's like, why is that coming from? Why is that happening? Did he eat something? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, like, do get a hit that he ate something. But I also find it fascinating that as you're cleaning up your UTIs, your dog's getting UTIs because <laughs> it's an unwinding of that entanglement 
of that coherence of the two of them together. And it's so profound that I think that we often look at these animals as they could be the biggest gifts that give us the best coherent frequency, but instead, or maybe with consciousness, we can shift this. They're the absorbers. They're the sponges in our house that want to help us heal by taking our crap on. You know, that's way more of a truth than you may even realize. And so think about the fact that when we're upset, if we have a pet, when you're upset, you're crying, you're angry, whatever, who comes over and offers that unconditional love? They put their head on your lap. They sit next to you. They wait for you to pet them. And what happens when you start to pet them is you start to feel better, right? Because you're now releasing some of that negative energy and they have that big shoulder and they say, here, right here, I'll take it for you. Right here on the top of the head, I'll take it for you. And I don't want people to feel guilty, like, oh my gosh, I'm dumping all my garbage on my pet. No, I think as as we are all players in the universe, I think they have what they chose to be their path and their purpose. And part of their purpose, if you think about it, is to support us. This is a very, very heavy dimension. And if we didn't have the support of pets and plants or animals in general, you know, could we really make it through this? It's a very dense type of environment. And so um, they make it light and airy and, and they give us hope and inspiration and the ability to continually move forward when there's a lot of trauma going on. So I live in a food forest and I literally go out in my food forest every day. Sometimes it's a food jungle if it gets a little ahead of me. We're in rainy season right now. So I'm telling you, these weeds are overgrowing. But, you know, when I go out there, I just totally transform any stress that I thought I had. I'm touching my avocado trees and my Barbados cherries and I've got bitter melon growing right now and macadamia and passion fruit and grapes and mangoes. And it, it's just absolutely amazing as you watch nature do its thing. And it doesn't need us, right? We need to be taking some lessons from our pets and from nature in general. And to that point as well, the fascia, as you talked about earlier, takes a lot of that trauma and that and stores a lot of that. So, yeah. you know, I would imagine that you and I love the the lymph so much that I know you have a love for the fascia. And I, I know you have a new course out with the fascia that one of the reasons I wanted to talk about that today was because as I have studied this whole world of terrain medicine and the spaces between the cells and the extracellular matrix and all the things and the names that it has, yeah. I've really gotten to the point, Marlene, where I'm just like, if you want to work in the terrain, you best work in the fascia and the lymph. Otherwise, you ain't. <laughs> working in the terrain you might be aware of the train you might even try to change the train by opening up drainage remedies but to literally lay your hands and work on the fascia and the lymph is how you're going to change the physical terrain manifestation of what it's holding on to and i know i've had a dog lose a toe from um cancerous tumor and so we worked on her fascia we had a weimariner that was one of i think there were 16 in the litter or something <laughs> Or a little thunder just got never enough love and and his fascia was really tight and so we did a lot of fascia work on him because he was inside a uterus with 15 other puppies a lot of fascia tightness you know and now we have this little uh bernie's mountain doodle entity being that's just so fabulous and i she has had a couple hot spots because we had her down south carolina i didn't know how to handle hair versus fur and I've had to work the fascia around that. So the first time I did it and it went systemic quick. This time I was like, okay, she's traumatized by something. Let's just work the fascia. So how do you handle the fascia on fur babies? So we do lymphatic and we do fascia. So lymphatic, I have a special machine that I use that produces negative ions and a microcurrent and inert gases. And it comes through a glass probe. So we are able to set that on drainage points you know, it's a is it the let the let no um this is called xp2 xp2 yeah i know them all yeah. Yeah, yeah and so um so we open up the drainage areas and then we um we do circular motions to uh help to 
stimulate the flow. Up. Yeah, yeah. Stimulate flow and, and loosen it up and get circulation going. And then we sweep it into the appropriate drainage point. So that's how we do our lymphatic. And yeah. the machine is so strong, we can actually set it to do way down internally where you couldn't do that manually. And then the magic is the fascia. And Deanna Hansen and I, I think Deanna's going to be on your program soon. Uh, she and I have worked together to create a fascia decompression for your fur baby. And it is a total empowerment course for pet parents because we're teaching the pet parent how to do this release for their pet, which they can do as often as they want. And there's no tools required. We teach you how to use your hands to do that decompression. Very safe, extremely effective. My disclaimer, it is not replacing working with a good veterinarian. It's not replacing the six steps that I just went through, i.e. don't be feeding toxic food and expect fascia decompression to make your animal totally normal, right? So you really have to put the whole thing together. This is not a pill for the ill and a diet for the disease model, like in allopathic me medicine where you name it, you blame it, and then you have a treatment. This is getting down to how the body actually works. So we're creating a positive terrain. We're supporting the biological processes of the body that are already intelligently there. And we're just trying not to block them. We're trying to assist them. And then we're using courses like lymphatic drainage and fascia decompression to further assist the body in being able to do its function. So if you think about lifestyle, animals used to live out Doors all the time. They had to chase their food down to eat breakfast and they had to kill it and wrestle with it. And same thing at night if they were hungry again. So they had high intensity activity. They had a lot of movement. Sure, they played and romped and then they laid down and they slept. But nowadays, our animals spend most of their time sleeping. Taking a walk around the block twice a day to go potty does not simulate high intensity exercise. And we know that high intensity exercise is one of those hormetic stressors that are part of how the body adapts to being able to clean itself and adapt and morph into being able to function better. So these are really important principles and being able to do the fascia work will help to release a lot of that stuckage. That's a good clinical term for you, but it's all the goo that it's just not moving anymore because we have so many toxins and we have so little movement and little exercise and then all the EMF and all the things we've just talked about, it just leads to a disaster. Um, and, and I'll mention that most animals are living seven years shorter than they did 20 years ago. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because I literally, I was impressed with how long we got our dog slip until I had a conversation with Marlene. And then I was like, okay, I'm not doing something right. <laughs> we had all these dogs. We don't go to vets like really, really randomly because we know, I mean, I was an animal science major. I don't know everything, but I know enough. And we know how to live biologically. And we've always fed our animals because I did nutritional research with real raw food because I know that's the best way that they perform all the things. And we had mixed large breeds, 90, 80, 100 pound dogs live to 15, 16 years old. And I was impressed with that, which is quite good. Marlene, how long do your dogs live and cats? Um, my kitty right now is 22 going on 23. Um, he just, it, usually he's, I'm usually doing podcasts and interviews at night and it's around dinner time. So he's usually all up in the camera, but I think he's sleeping right now somewhere. And, uh, but he's, he's turning 23 and, uh, very minimal, uh, problems. Now he's been a raw eater now since uh, almost 15 years. So in the beginning, I didn't know any better. So when we first right. got him, he was eating processed foods and then we had to wean him off of that and start being more species appropriate. But yeah, he's vibrant. He's running around. He's acting like a kitten. Nobody believes me when I say how old he is until I show them the picture of when he was kitten. And, it's and dated. Didn't, you have, didn't you have a lab that lived to be like 21 years old or something or one yeah. of your clients? In, in my presentations, I have several animals that are documented in the Guinness World Book of Record that lived into their 30s. So, yeah. And there was a cat in the Guinness World Book of Record that lived to be 38. Same owner, a guy in Texas. He was a plumber in Texas, had another cat that lived to be 34. So when people say to me, oh, my animal lives a long time, and I'm thinking, um, A, they're decrepit by the time they get into their mid-teens. Yeah. And, and, you know, they're just riddled with all these diseases. That is not aging. <laughs> that is that is bad aging, right? I'm 66. 
And the last time I saw a human doctor, I gave birth to my last child. And I haven't been to a doctor since. And, and I'm not saying that because doctors are bad. It's because I've created the lifestyle very much like you were saying about your pets. We don't have to be dependent on our veterinarian or our doctor if we know how to live an appropriate lifestyle. If we can maintain that terrain, yes, there's still always going to be times where something, accidents happen. Sure. So like have that to uh, incur, if, you know, if an accident's an accident. But as far as breakdown and, and illnesses and metabolic breakdowns, um, I was at the A Forum conference earlier this year, and I did my biological testing, and uh, it was pretty impressive. I was ten years younger than my biological age, so I they thought I was in my fifties, which was kind of cool. And I registered as one of the highest levels of antioxidants. The guy said, "Whatever you're doing, just keep doing it." And kudos to you. <laughs> so, and it's my lifestyle, and that's how I encourage my pet parents to do their pet's lifestyle. And here's the, another cool part that I really emphasize is that people will do things for the pets that they won't do for themselves. It's so true. But once they see the changes in their animals and how much improved they get, they're excited to start doing it for themselves. And I'll hear my pet parents go, oh, can I take that? And can I do that? And, and so that has inspired spas, family wellness centers, which are detox centers for people and their pets, or I say for pets and their parents, for them to be able to go and have a spa day, S-P-A-W-S, and be able to start nourishing their bodies, not just going and getting massage. It's not about that. It's really about detoxifying the organs of elimination. How can we make the body work better so it ages more gracefully? She'll even do foot baths, iron cleanse foot baths on dogs. She's got a picture of this I think it was a Great Dane with its paws in in the tub. And I was like, wow, that's impressive. I mean, wow. And yeah. she'll do Weber Light IVs and she'll, you know, she, like she just said, she'll do the lymph work, the fascia work. She'll do neural therapies. She truly treats the animals like we treat the humans in bioregulatory medicine. And to her own point as well, that because we live this lifestyle, we don't become dependent and nor do our dogs unless those emergencies, those acute situations occur. Like I remember one of our dogs ate a poinsettia plant. Yep, rushed him right to the hospital, had a stomach pumped because it was toxic. So yeah. we gave me a poinsettia, knew better, but you know, had it up high thinking it was no big deal. But it's, we've got to create that environment, that lifestyle, that this becomes the foundation of how we live. And then it becomes very obvious, like, you know, I think so many people buy toys and different things for their animals that I would never touch in a bazillion years for my dog. You know, it's like w we have these conversations about what's in Ubers and what's in different offices where it's this Glade plugins and the bad lighting and the bad soaps and all the things. And it's like, oh, I feel so toxic just being in here. And yet people do it to their dogs all the time because they think they're being cute and they think, oh, look at this cute toy or this cute shampoo or this cute bodysuit or whatever that's full of phthalates or or plastics that are seeping into their skin and you know right down to their collars that they're wearing to start to pay attention to what they're exposed to but what i love about animals there's no placebo effect they don't believe a freaking thing they don't have a belief system like we do so if it works it works if it doesn't work it doesn't work and that's where the evidence based medicine comes in with bioregulatory medicine is and i i invite every one of you to download her pdf i don't know what is the percentage of people that have animals i'm sure you probably know that oh it's extremely high i think right now we're in the 60 percentile range of people that own a cat and a dog or cat or a dog um okay. and it went up uh, from before covid it in numbers increased over 13 percent wow during COVID, yeah. Which so, is awesome because we can't do this alone. So we need our unconditional love team members known as our pets to do this with. So yeah. I I encourage you and invite you to download her PDF and start taking the actual steps and watch the improvement and then tell us about it. We love to hear the stories about how it improved your life because that then can help others too. And, you know, go to her tell them how to find you and how to get not only the PDF, but the two other courses that you have. If you could talk a little bit about those. 
I would be honored. So, and even spas. So if you go to the DR, like doctor, so drmarlenesiegel.com, super easy. Just have to spell my name right. And that is the hub of everything. Our online store, our supplements, our products, the educational courses. And I do teach veterinarians how to integrate alternative medicine into their practices. So if you love your veterinarian and you've done the Empowered Pet Parent course and you want your veterinarian to consider expanding their practice, then introduce it to them as well. And it's amazing the transformations that we're doing. It, it really is. Each item by itself is life altering. And then when you put it together, it is, I, I don't like to use the word miraculous because it's how we were designed to yeah. survive anyway, but it's just that we've become so distanced from it that we, we think it's new and novel, but it's not. It's how we were ancestrally designed to live. And so you have a course, you have the six step, which is a free PDF, but then you have a deeper dive into the six steps course, which is a paid course. So once they do the PDF for free, they want to go a little deeper. They can do a deeper dive course. And then you have a fascia fur baby course as well, which is near and dear to my heart. Yes. So you're doing this. So can they can access this all on your website, correct? Yes. And, and my encouragement is I don't care where you dip your toe in. I don't care where you start. But logically, it makes sense if you do the Empowered Pet Parent course and you get yourself set up for success, all right? So now you've changed the diet, you've improved the water, you've figured out where your toxic loads are. We have recommendations for companies that make wonderful cleaning products. And my daughter actually has an essential oil business where she makes cleaning products for people. And so you can purchase that. And now you're cleaning with healthier products and minimizing the amount of toxins. And then um, you get all your foundation done and then the right supplements and start changing that lifestyle and the terrain, get the microbiome built up, and then you start doing the fascia work. And it doesn't have to be in that order, but it kind of makes sense that you don't want to be putting the roof on the house before you built your foundation. So it's not going to hurt at all. And it can only be beneficial if you choose to only do the fascia work but you're going to see the greatest effects when you can put the whole picture together and incorporate it. And it's very inexpensive. It's literally cheaper than one that visit to do both courses. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we're going to get on this. Code. We'll have a code. Um, we don't know what that code will be yet, but it'll be down here in the show notes. So make sure you use the code so that you get all the benefits from using the code. And then you'll be hooked up with Marlene's community as well as ours. Um, and keep diving deep into how it all works and know that love, which is why those little fur babies heal us in so many ways and take on our crap in so many ways because they truly unconditionally love you, much like Marlene and I unconditionally love every one of you listening to this because you've taken the time, the effort out of your life or within your life, I should say, to listen to your own heart, to listen to why and how the body really works so that you can be empowered so that what we want more than anything is for you not to be dependent upon a vet office or a doctor's office, but get knowledge that you can impactfully put in profoundly into your life and watch the miracles happen. As she said, we don't expect miracles, but it does look miraculous when this stuff starts happening. You're just like, I don't know. I don't even know why it happened to begin with. But when we apply the biological principles, it unwinds it and we look awesome. But really, the source, the system did it. The nervous system did it. The healing capacity, the God part of us heals us from within. And I truly appreciate so much what you have done for animals and what you've taken on to change veterinary medicine and to educate the vets out there. And I need to get better with my vet, who I only see once a year, who painfully <laughs> deals with me. I've only gone to her twice, um, but I need to talk to her about this course and educate her about this because there's so much to be done. And we have a local vet actually here that's now a client that I met in the last six months that we started to send people to have been to the Paracelsus Clinic, do everything biologically as well. Um, so we'll put a link in for them as well. Um, and and I'll connect you to because they would love you um, and, and you will love them. So, you know, love your pets, but truly know that you can help them heal and you can apply all the same principles that Dr. Marlene's put together for your fur babies and apply them to your human babies. And the same effect will happen coincidentally. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> oh, 
all about that. Is there anything you want to share with the community or anything else in your wise wisdom? Uh, just take the first step, right? It's all it is. It's little baby steps. And if you just take that very first step, we are both here to support you 100%. And it will be the best transformation in your life that you can imagine. Thank you so much, Marlene, for your time and your passion and your devotion to improving and impacting this world as you continue to do so. And thank you to all of you for sharing this and rating this so it helps other people find this podcast that really does work. So I appreciate you all doing that. And here's much love from our heart to you and your fur babies. Bye.